Hello, good evening, everybody. Uh, can you hear me okay? It's wonderful to, to see all your faces here. Um, a lot of uh, oblates uh, or inquirers I haven't met yet. Um, so maybe throughout the weekend, if you just uh, introduce yourself to me, I'd really appreciate just to get to know you and put a, a name to, to a face. Uh, they say that you know, when, when you leave the monastery, you should always have a, a, a cloister with you. And so for these talks, I'm kind of bound within these uh, white tape. Because <laughs> uh, we got the, the video going on. But um, it's great to be here. I really hope that this weekend can be a time of uh, deepening your own prayer, uh, commitment to Christ, and really being open up to uh, the great love of the Father um, through the work of His Son. So during this weekend, I'm just going to be speaking about the uh, divine office. Uh, something that we just did in the Abbey Church uh, twice already. Um, and trying to think about the theology, the spirituality, and also how we can uh, pray the divine office better. So I've titled this uh, retreat, Praying the Psalms, uh, Living in the Divine Current. Uh, this is not really uh, my retreat title, um, a seminarian, he wrote an MA thesis uh, with a similar title, and I kind of just stole it from him. Uh, it, it's quite nice. <laughs> but let us begin, as we always do. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O God, come to my assistance. O Lord, make Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus departed to the mountain to pray. Like Jesus, we have all come from different places, uh, different environments, different contexts. Uh, but we are all here now, and we follow the example of our Lord, our Lord Jesus, who departed from the many things that was committed to him, his own teaching, his own work, his own social obligations. Uh, Jesus departed to the mountain to pray. Uh, so all of us here, we depart from the chaos of our lives, uh, the situations we find ourselves in, the busyness of work, family, and other social obligations. Uh, with our Lord, we ascend the mountain uh, this weekend to spend some time alone, to be with God in prayer. Uh, we have all come from different places, some far, some near. Uh, some are here, uh, just kind of through the providence of God. And it's really wonderful uh, that the Holy Spirit is working, bringing us all together here in this time together. It is for us a time to a focus on the better part, we can be a lot of times like Mary, I mean Martha, uh, but this weekend is a time to be like Mary, uh, sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to him. And that's why a silence is so integral part of this retreat. My prayer during this time is that you, you would deepen your love for Jesus and that you will be caught up in that the divine love made possible by the Incarnation. For this retreat, I'll basically divide it into uh, you know, four talks, the, the four conferences, and each of the conferences will be divided into uh, three parts. So for the first part, I will just be speaking about the Divine Office in, in general. Uh, the second part, 
I will speak about a particular hour, whether it be Lods, noon prayer, or Vespers, or one of the other hours. And lastly, I will talk about a, a specific psalm. St. Benedict tells us that uh, nothing is to be re- preferred to the work of God. Uh, nothing is to be preferred to attending the choir, uh, going to church, and giving ourselves completely to God. And these words, uh, nothing is to be preferred to the work of God, is in a closet in which we hang our kukulas. Uh, the kukula is the garment that monks wear when they make their solemn profession. Uh, Brother Lavang, he just made his solemn profession uh, just about uh, 10 days ago. And so whenever we uh, go into this closet and we put on a kukula, uh, normally for Mass and Vespers on Sundays, we read the words, uh, nothing is to be preferred uh, to the work of God. It's that daily reminder for us, which is always important because we tend to uh, sometimes forget things uh, that are not always right there in front of our faces. So for this first part, I would like to focus on the divine office as the prayer of Christ. When we're talking about the liturgy of the hours, praying the Psalms in the church, what's the context? Do we go back 1,500 years to this time of St. Benedict, where he talks about praying all the Psalms in a week? Uh, No, we have to go back even further. Do we go back 3,000 years to when the Psalms were first written? No, we have to go back even further. We have to go back all the way to the beginning of time, when there was no time, when it was simply God, the Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. From all eternity, the Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father. And the church fathers, they speak about this current of divine love existing between the three persons of the Holy Trinity. And they spoke about this in the Greek word perichoresis, which means, maybe surprisingly, dance. The relationship that the Holy Trinity has with one another is something like a dance. There is this exchange of movement, this exchange of ideas, this exchange of love. It is a perfect harmony where one person is in perfect unity with the other person. And I think that's a very uh, beautiful analogy of the Most Holy Trinity. St. Augustine would say, the Father is the lover, the Son is the beloved, and the Holy Spirit is that love that exists uh, between them. Blessed Columba Marmion, he died less than a hundred years ago, and I will be quoting from him a lot during this uh, retreat uh, from from this book, Christ, the Ideal of the Monk. Um, But in this book, he has two chapters on the divine office, on the liturgy of the hours, that I find very uh, beautiful, very fitting. Blessed Columba Marmion was the abbot of a monastery in Belgium. Uh, Initially, he was a diocesan priest for a, a few years. But in one of his pilgrimages to Rome, uh, he stopped, out, stopped at a Belgian monastery and was kind of attracted to it and uh, desired to, to enter the monastery. And so uh, that's what he did. And I think it's important for uh, monks um, and oblates here at Mount Angel to, to really understand the spirituality of Columba Marmion, uh, because he really formed 
uh, you know, the monks that have, are making their jubilee profession on Sunday. Uh, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago, the monks of the abbey were reading Columba Marmon, and we still do today. Uh, Father Lim is the junior master, and this is a big part of monastic formation. Um, but you, know, you don't have to read it all because maybe it doesn't apply, um, but at least the part in the divine office is very rich and very beautiful. And hopefully, by sharing some of this with you here today, uh, you will really get that um, theology from uh, Columba Marmion. And so, kind of going along this line, there is this dance in this Holy Trinity. Uh, Columba Marmion, he says, the eternal utterance, the word, simply being what he is, is like a divine hymn. Jesus is the eternal word of God. Uh, Marmion describes Christ as his divine hymn, singing his praises uh, to the Father. He is a living hymn who sings the praise of the Father by expressing the plenitude of the Father's perfection. And in another place he writes, the word is the canticle that God sings inwardly to himself. Uh, whenever somebody is in love, you hear them singing to themselves. Uh, those of us who are in the monastery you know that Brother Lavang, he loves to sing to himself. And you know, I think this is a good sign. It really shows that joy, you know, that happiness, and that you know, when you're in love, you sing. Uh, and so uh, Marmon describes is the love that the son has for the father uh, is like this song. This existed from all eternity, uh, but God wanted another to share in this divine love. And so he created the world. You know, we read about that in the book of Genesis. And then eventually, after thousands of years, you know, the eternal Son of God was made flesh and dwelt among us. And that is the mystery of the incarnation. And through the incarnation, God united humanity with himself and allowed us to enter into that eternal praise. Through all eternity, the Son praises the Father. Through the incarnation, we enter into that eternal praise. Columba Marmion writes, Christ's humanity is like the temple where the Word sings the divine canticle which glorifies the Father, or rather, the sacred humanity is carried along in the current of divine life. And so um, the incarnation, Christ the Son of God, you know, he is taken up into that current of divine life, and we are taken into that life ourselves. In another place, he speaks about the human words that Christ used. Uh, from all eternity, the Son did not use human words. Uh, but after the Son of God became man, he did use human words. Marmion writes, In the heart of Christ, the praise of God finds expression in human words of adoration, propitiation, and intercession. Um, and so that's something you know, quite marvelous uh, to think about, that God would speak to himself using the words of men. You know. Sorry, I, I put those pictures up there because I don't like the black screen. <laughs> Uh, but, yeah, God's ways are not our ways. <laughs> so, uh, that, that's fine. And so, you know, Christ, you know, he, maybe he didn't speak 
English, you know, maybe more Aramaic or uh, Hebrew, um, but those were still human words, everyday language that the Jewish people use. And with those human words, you know, he was praying the Psalms. He was praising the Father. And you know, that's something very uh, beautiful to think about. And everything that Jesus did, uh, Romano Guardini, who uh, you know, is known for his book, uh, The Lord or the Spirit of the Liturgy, really brings together uh, the life of Christ and what happens through the liturgy. Uh, Romano Guardini writes, Jesus was man and God in one. What he did was the result not only of human and temporal decision, but also his divine and eternal will. Thus, his action was not merely of transitory time, but existed simultaneously in eternity. Now, whatever Jesus does, it doesn't pass away. It continues on. The, the, the catechism really uh, puts this well, and some of the, the theologians say it succinctly in saying, history has passed through mystery. <clears throat> history, that is the life of Christ, his death and resurrection, has passed through the liturgy. If his action, if his words do not pass away, how does it come to us? It comes through the liturgy. And the catechism has a very beautiful way of putting this. The catechism says, in the liturgy of the church, it is principally his own paschal mystery that Christ signifies and makes present. When his hour comes, he lives out the unique event of history, which does not pass away. Jesus dies, buried, rises from the dead, and is seated at the right hand of the Father once for all. His Paschal mystery is a real event that occurred in our history, but it is unique. All other historical events happen once, and then they pass away. The Paschal mystery, by contrast, cannot remain only in the past, because by his death, he destroyed death, and all that Christ is participates in the divine eternity. And so there is that connection between what we do in the liturgy and what happened in the life of Christ. How important is the liturgy? Is the Mass really the greatest thing we can participate in while we are on earth? Uh, St. John Vianney would say yes. Why? He says, Martyrdom is nothing in comparison with the Mass because martyrdom is the sacrifice of man to God, whereas the Mass is the sacrifice of God for man. It is truly the work of God. It is not our work. Uh, we're simply taken up into what Christ did. And so th that is the Mass in particular. Uh, what is the relationship between the Mass and the Liturgy of the Hours, which is kind of the talk? So I'm, it's kind of it took a while to get there, but we're kind of getting there. I see some of you are taking notes. Uh, that's perfectly fine. Uh, the notes will be available um, online. Uh, I'm hoping to get it up within a week uh, along with the videos, um, just so you know. Uh, you know. You're free to write as well. What is the connection between the Liturgy of the Hours and the Mass? Blessed Columba Marmion writes, With the holy sacrifice of the Mass, around which the divine office gravitates, it forms the most complete expression of religion. And so Marmon sees the Mass really 
you know, at the center, and the divine office is kind of you know, surrounding it. Uh, you can think of it as a splash in the water and the ripple effects. You know, if the, the, the rock hitting the water is the mass, then the ripples is the liturgy of the hours. It is taking the fruits, the graces of the mass to, to all the parts of the rest of the day. The general instruction of the liturgy of the hours which is another document I'll quote from quite extensively during this weekend as well. Uh, basically, it tells us something about uh, the history, the theology, the spirituality of the liturgy of the hours. Sorry? No. It, it tells us something a little bit about the liturgy of the hours, um, but also uh, kind of some of the details about you know, the parts of the liturgy of the hours. So, uh, this is also good reading as well. But like Columba Marmion, this document, which I'll refer to as the general instruction, speaks about the hours in relationship to the Mass. The liturgy of the hours extends to the different hours of the day, the praise and prayer the memorial of the mysteries of salvation and the foretaste of heavenly glory, which are offered to us in the Eucharistic mystery. And so uh, along the same lines, it's extending to the different hours what is present in the Eucharist, in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Our Holy Father, St. Benedict, We don't have to read too much of the Holy Rule before we get into his chapters on the divine office. And when we read it, we can think he's kind of obsessed with the divine office. You know, out of 73 short chapters, he devotes at least 13 to the divine office. And you know, if you've read it, you know he's talking a lot about you know, what psalms should be said at which particular hour. Uh, but in chapter 19, he really shows how fundamental praying the divine office is and how God is even more present and during this time. St. Benedict says, We believe that the divine presence is everywhere and that in every place the eyes of the Lord are watching the good and the wicked. But beyond the least doubt, we should believe this to be especially true when we celebrate the divine office. And so, you know, the eyes of God are, in a way, you can say, focused on us when we are praying in the divine office. The general instruction on the Liturgy of the Hours, uh, it really states quite simply how important it is for the church to pray these prayers, saying, the public and communal prayer of the people of God is rightly considered among the first duties of the church. Uh, that is, the whole church. And so uh, the, the church requires priests, deacons, and consecrated to pray the divine office. And that is among the first duties. Um, but it's also uh, something uh, for uh, the, the, the family, the laity uh, as well. I would like to read now from the Gospel of Matthew, a parable that is related to the divine office. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out at dawn to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with them for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. Going out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You too, go into my vineyard, and I will give you what is just. So they went off. And he went out again around noon, 
and around three o'clock and did likewise. Going out about five o'clock, he found others standing around and said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They answered, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You too go into my vineyard. What does that have to do with the divine office, uh, the liturgy of the hours? Uh, if you paid attention to the times in which the landowner was going to call people to work at dawn, at nine, at noon, at three, at five. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> These are the liturgy of the hours. Now, in some monasteries, we don't pray at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m., uh, but those of you who have prayed with the four volume uh, will know that in that four volume, there is a prayer for the 9 a.m. hour and the 3 p.m. hour. And so these are really uh, sacred times given to us for prayer. The general instruction uh, speaks about the different references in the New Testament about the apostles going up to pray during these hours. And it says, in the Acts of the Apostles, the disciples are presented as coming together at the third hour, the scent of the Holy Spirit, Pentecost. The Prince of Apostles, St. Peter, went up to the housetop at about the sixth hour, which is noon, to pray. Peter and John went up to the temple for the prayers at the ninth hour, at 3 p.m., Late at night, Paul and Silas were praying and singing praises to God. Uh, late at night, uh, that is, uh, vigils, uh, matins. And so uh, these hours uh, are already uh, really uh, sanctified. What we do in the divine office can really be summed up in what we do four or five times during the divine office. That is, we pray, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. That, that is what praying the divine office is about. Uh, it's not about us, but about giving glory unto God. And so that's really just a reminder of what we are doing. Okay. I'm just keeping track of the time here. I would like to, for this evening session, uh, focus on the hour of Lods. Lods comes from the, the Latin word uh, laus, meaning uh, to praise. And it is given for the morning office, um, probably because in the arrangement of the Psalms in uh, St. Benedict's rule, he had the monks pray every day, Psalms 148 to 150. And these, in these Psalms, we hear the word uh, praise uh, a lot. You know, praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him from the vault of highest heaven. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, stars of morning. Uh, and it, it was just praise, praise God, praise God, praise Him, all His angels, praise Him, all His hosts. Um, and so for that reason, uh, it is believed that you know, we have the word lauds, uh, praise, as um, the, the name given to the morning office. What I would like to kind of just you know, focus your attention on uh, for each hour is a Christological mystery. And so... Uh, for Lods, the Christological mystery is truly that of the resurrection. You know, we, we pray Lods you know, usually at the, the beginning of day when the sun is beginning to rise. And uh, we, we hear from Father Quigley uh, speaking about this inter interesting connection between Lods and the resurrection. He says, this is the office of daybreak and hence its symbolism of Christ's resurrection. Christ, the light of the world, rose from the tomb on Easter morning 
like a radiant sun, trampling over darkness and shedding his brightness upon earth. The hymns, psalms, antiphons, versicles of lauds all proclaim the mystery of Christ's resurrection. And so you know, we really you know, think about you know, the sun and the light. You know, we speak about the Christ as you know, the, the rising sun, you know, waiting for him in the resurrection. You know, we don't know when the resurrection happened, but we believe it happened in that cuss in which light overcomes darkness. Uh, Jesus uh, rising from the dead, life overcomes and death. And so you know, whenever we, we go to Lod's, it's kind of you know, good to really think about Jesus and a particular a mystery. The church speaks of both uh, lauds and vespers as the, the two hinges of the liturgical hours, really the two most important of the liturgical hours throughout the day. They are the longest. You know, they also have the, the Benedictus and the Magnificat. Uh, and so you know, sometimes people wonder you know, what they should pray. Uh, you know, usually that's a, you know, a, a good choice. Uh, for those who are able to do that during that time. Now, uh, those of you who have um, your, your booklets, uh, I had you have, um, um, have that as part of your, your schedule, we'll just look at a part of this. So if you uh, just open that first page, it says 96, uh, uh, 96 uh, Saturday Lods. You know, I began our prayer this evening with, you know, oh God, come to my assistance, oh Lord, make haste to help me. Uh, you know, we pray this a lot, you know, and those who pray the Roman office know that, you know, you can pray it, you know, up to five times a day. Here at the Abbey, we pray it twice a day. Uh, but this is a very beautiful beginning to any prayer that uh, we have. And it, it is believed that this, this prayer is coming from one of the Psalms. It was already in great use in the, the fourth century. Uh, St. John Cashin, who St. Benedict uh, explicitly references uh, two times in the Holy Rule, he has this book called the, the Conferences of the Desert Fathers. And two of those conferences are on prayer. And he speaks about this prayer, O God, come to my assistance, O Lord, make haste to help me. Uh, and he really explains uh, the, the beauty and the universal uh, nature of this prayer. John Cashin, he writes, for keeping up continual recollection of God, this pious formula is to be ever set before you. O God, come to my assistance. O Lord, make haste to help me. For this verse has not unreasonably been picked out from the whole scripture for this purpose. For it embraces all the feelings which can be implanted in human nature and can be fitly and satisfactorily adapted to every condition and assault. And so he says, no matter what's going on in your life, you know, whether you're, you're happy, you're sad, you're fearful, you're trusting, you're confident, uh, prideful, or humble, uh, you can say this prayer. And so he goes on to explain. He says that, you know, if you're affected by gluttony, you want to eat something before the appointed hour, or you want to have another cookie, and he says that if you, you have the, the waft of the odors of the royal dainties, and you find that against your own will that you long for them, you must pray at once, O oh God, come to my assistance. 
Oh Lord, make haste to help me. Okay, some of you had two cookies tonight, I can tell. <laughs> or another situation, he says, at the third hour, so it's probably 3 p.m. in the afternoon, uh, we speak about that as the, the noonday demon. He says, at the third hour, sleep glues my head to the sacred page. Do we know what that's like? Yeah, probably. Yeah. It's three o'clock. I'm getting sleepy. Uh, sleep glues my head to the sacred page. And I am forced to anticipate the time of rest. I must cry out, O oh God, come to my assistance. O oh Lord, make haste to help me. Now you're getting sleepy. Okay. <laughs> That's, that's a good prayer. And he says, we must then ceaselessly and continuously pour forth this prayer in adversity that we may be delivered, in prosperity that we may be preserved. When you are going to bed or eating, think on this. This thought in your heart may be to you a saving formula and not only keep you unharmed from all attacks of devils, but to purify you from all faults and earthly stains and lead you to the invisible and celestial contemplation. And you know, he kind of you know, goes on to give more examples of how and this prayer is so fitting, uh, but you could probably just imagine how really we can pray this prayer uh, any time. You know, oh God, come to my assistance. Oh Lord, make haste to help me. And you know, the beginning of Lods, in, in a sense, Lods is um, the first hour of the day. And because vigils is supposed to be prayed you know, at midnight, uh, and, you know, uh, I know we, we don't do that, but uh, Lodz was thought of about uh, the first hour of the day, and so um, really asking for God's assistance uh, in our morning. And whenever you know, we do this, and you know, something small, and maybe we don't think about it, you know, we make the sign of the cross, uh, that it is, is through the saving cross you know, that, that God's grace comes into our life. And so when we're asking for God's help, uh, we know it is only in the cross and that we are saved. Now, if you open uh, again, or just right where you are, on page 98, uh, the next page, I would like to point out uh, three things before we start to pray the Psalms. The antiphon, the psalm title, and the Christological text. Uh, some of you have probably prayed you know, the Psalms for many years and uh, maybe you don't think much about these three things. Um, but you know, they really help us enter into what the prayer, the Psalm, is about uh, and kind of really prepares us in some sense. And so for the antiphon for tomorrow during Lauds, we read, We do well to sing your praise. We do well to sing to your name most high and proclaim your mercy at daybreak. Uh, and so we know just right there, you know, this is going to be a psalm of praise. And it's talking about daybreak, uh, not only the sun rising, uh, but also speaking of the resurrection of Christ happening in the morning. Next to the number 92, we hear praise of God the Creator. And so, you know, we praise God for many things, you know, maybe for his love, for his wisdom, uh, his, his works. Uh, here it really focuses on uh, God as a creator. And then a little bit underneath that to the right, we hear the uh, Christological verse. You know, the Psalms were wit written you know, a thousand years before Christ. Um, how are we to read it uh, thinking about Jesus? Well, we have a little short text that helps us with that. And it simply says, sing in praise of Christ's redeeming work. And so what Jesus has done. You know, the Father, God, has you know, created the universe. Uh, and in Christ, you know, we have a new uh, creation. 
the Psalms are words given to us by God, really expressing the deepest sentiments of the heart. And you know, Psalm 92, it's really a heart full of love, joy, and somebody who wants to give himself you know, entirely to Christ. And I'll just kind of read through a little bit at a time and offer a little commentary here. It is good to praise you, O Lord, and sing to your name, O Most High. It is good to praise you. Um, whether we're feeling down, uh, whether we're even happy, uh, we're in a good mood, bad mood, we're, we're afraid, or we're in trusting mode, mood, uh, it is good for man to praise the Lord and to sing to your name, and that is, in the holy name of Jesus, and by which we are saved. And then he says, to describe your unfailing love at daybreak. And so we have that again, you know, echoes of the light, but also echoes of the resurrection of Christ, and your faithfulness through the hours of the night. The next verse, we have the uh, instruments to the accompaniment of zither and harp and the melody of a lyre. And so while we can use our voice to praise God, in a sense, when we use instruments, in a way we take creation, uh, even inanimate objects, you know, to, to praise the Lord. You know, we, we hear, you know, sun and moon, you know, bless the Lord. You know, seas and ocean, uh, bless the Lord. Uh, here we have, you know, zither and harp and the lyre uh, as well. On the next page, Yes, O Lord, you gladden me with what you do. I sing, out the, I sing out for joy at the work of your hands. Uh, you know, really seeing what God has done in our life, uh, the, the creation, the work of his hands. And you know, we are kind of you know, drawn back to the book of Genesis here uh, in Genesis 2 when you know, God forms man out of the clay. And you can kind of think of God as you know, forming man out of you know, uh, the clay using his hands. In a way, you know, God is very close and intimate uh, to creation. Uh, but also, when the, the psalmist says, you know, I sing out for joy at the work of your hands, you know, maybe you can think about the hands that were nailed to the cross, of those hands. Uh, you know, today is the feast of St. Padre Pio, uh, who was uh, you know, privileged to, to have the stigmata, uh, the wounds of Christ, uh, in his hands. Um, that is really you know, the work by which we, we are saved. How great your works are, O Lord! Uh, how deep your thoughts, O Great One! Uh, you know, God's thoughts are not our thoughts, um, but you know, St. Paul says, but we have the mind of Christ. In a way, we have the thoughts of God. Uh, we've been privileged with this. Uh, you know, on our own, and we couldn't have come up with these thoughts, um, but only through God's revelation, his gift to us, uh, that we can have the mind of Christ. The brainless man does not comprehend. Uh, the fool does not understand that although the wicked grow like weeds and those who do evil thrive, he will destroy them forever and ever. That echoes you know, our Lord's saying, you know, bright, broad, the road, wide the gate, and that leads to destruction, uh, but narrow the, the road and you know, small the gate, and that leads to life. You know, the psalmist is saying, you know, the wicked grow like weeds. You know, those of you who have a garden uh, know how, how, how hard it is to you know, get those weeds out of there and how they always come back. And he's like, the wicked, uh, you know, in a way, they, they're always flourishing. 
uh, or at least like multiplying in some sense. And St. Benedict, you know, he kind of speaks about how the way in which he proposes is not the broad road, uh, but rather the narrow road. He says, do not be daunted immediately by fear and run away from the road that leads to salvation. It is bound to be narrow at the outset. But as we progress in this way of life and in faith, we shall run on the path of God's commandments, our hearts overflowing with the inexpressible and the light of love. And so it's, it's narrow at the beginning, uh, but you know, that's for good reason. Um, in a way, it's purifying our heart, our desires, and so that we can love uh, even more uh, fully. Going to the next verse, but you are forever exalted, O Lord, and your enemies, O Lord, will perish. And the ultimate enemy uh, is Satan, is sin, uh, the evil spirit, and it's through Christ, and these enemies uh, perish. But you let me be like a wild ox tossing its horn. I am anointed with fresh oil. Probably you don't think of yourself like a wild ox very often. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, I, I, I think uh, maybe we can try to read this spiritually. <laughs> um, you know, that, that anointing of oil is, really signifies uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, one of the, the church fathers uh, speaking about baptism, you know, after being baptized and immersed in the water, uh, they're anointed with holy oil, a holy chrism. You know, we still do that in baptisms today. Um, but but uh, the church father, I believe it was St. Cyril of Alexandria, he says uh, that the new Christian is oiled because he is a warrior uh, getting ready to go into battle. Uh, in a way, you know, that wild ox tossing its horn. Uh, in a way, we're engaged in a spiritual battle. And so we need to be anointed uh, with the Holy Spirit. i just go down um, kind of close to the end, the third a verse from the, the, the bottom there. Those who are transplanted to the house of the Lord will grow vigorous in the courts of our God. Those who are transplanted to the house of the Lord will grow vigorous in the courts of our God. Now, I guess... Uh, that really makes me think about uh, you oblates and uh, that sense of stability uh, that you have in a place. Um, you know, although you don't live here uh, physically, you know, I believe that you can be, in a way, spiritually uh, transplanted here, uh, spiritually uh, transplanted into the house of the Lord, uh, take root here, um, and bear fruit in your life. And so for um, Benedictines, you know, oblates included, um, there is that stability in the community. Uh, one of the saying of the Desert Fathers is that you know, just as a tree that is constantly being uprooted uh, cannot bear fruit, uh, so too the monk that is constantly wandering uh, cannot bear fruit. Uh, and so how important it is to be spiritually grounded uh, in one place. I just have a few minutes now, um, and we'll just go through the, the, the next page there. This is the, the last part of the Benedictus. You know, we pray it every morning at Lodz, and... You know, perhaps you know, we've done this and never thought you know, why we actually pray this during Lodz. But um, the, you know, the last two stanzas there, 
uh, really uh, bring out uh, the reason why we pray the Benedictus during Lods. And the prayer of Zechariah goes, For our God, merciful and tender, will cause the bright dawn of salvation to rise on us. Um, it's the, the page after Psalm 92. Um, the number on the top is 107. Yeah. It's the third page over from the beginning. Yeah. And then the next page, 107. And to shine from heaven on those who live in the dark shadow of death to guide our steps into the path of peace. And so, we, you know, we really, yeah, kind of, with the, the liturgy of the hours, we're kind of bringing together the mystery of the Christ, uh, but also the cosmos, uh, the, from the rising of the sun to its setting, may the name of the Lord be praised. You know, God is the creator of the universe, and in a way, it, this, uh, the universe is brought up into the liturgy in its praise uh, to God. And so when um, the canticle of Zechariah speaks about the bright dawn of salvation is going to rise on us, to shine on those who dwell in the shadow of death, and that is in the death of sin and corruption, and guiding our feet uh, into the way of peace. And this is you know, the, the gift that Christ came to bring to us. Uh, we know perhaps what it is like to live in the darkness of sin. Uh, we perhaps know what it is to live without Christ even, um, and about that darkness. Um, but when you know, the light of Christ you know, did come into our life, oh, how bright that light was, and truly it guided our feet uh, into the way of peace. I will conclude now uh, just with uh, a prayer uh, that we have here. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, free us from the dark night of death. Let the light of resurrection dawn within our hearts to bring us to the radiance of eternal life. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.